Our next conversation will dig deeper into mentorship by identifying the strategies that really work. In short, it's not just ice cream cones and baseball games. We're going to start the conversation by welcoming Susan Taylor of CARES to speak with athlete and actor Victor Cruz, his mentee Eddie Cuba, and after their conversation they'll be joined by Marshawn Bacon uh, and his mentee Christian Champagne from Chicago and Mapaya Black Elk and his mentee Parol Tavrira from Albuquerque. Please welcome them to the stage. Well, good, good. Is it morning still? Good morning. Good morning. I am so honored to be here and what an extraordinary day yesterday was. You know, I'm here for one reason, because after 37 years at Essence, 27 of them as the chief editor, I thought that at this stage in my life, I'd be like kicked back, maybe teaching a little journalism magazine making at, a, at an historically black college. But the village is on fire. The village is on fire, so there's no retiring. And there's work that each of us must do. I'm here because the president has issued a call. My Brother's Keeper is a movement being built to create an underpinning for our young brothers. It is a movement that must be built to create pathways, pathways to high achievement for black and brown boys and any other vulnerable child in this nation. The shame of the nation is that we have an educational system that we can't point to working in any underserved community. So there's so much more that we can do. I am proud of the National Cares Mentoring Movement, which I'm the leader of, and it was founded as Essence Cares after Katrina just flooded the city of New Orleans where the Essence Music Festival is. And we said we can't go back and have a party. We have to have a party with a deeper purpose. And very often people show up for the party and not the purpose, and we can do both. So the National Cares Mentoring Movement, founded as Essence Cares, is now in 58 cities across the country. And our lead trainer, our chief program officer, Stephen Powell, you're somewhere in the house. Where are you, Stephen? <laughs> Stephen is right there. Look at Stephen. Because any of you who are running mentoring organizations, and we have protocols that are trauma-informed. I hate the term because it's overused. But growing up in poverty, Beyond our view, poverty hurts. Growing up in poverty and showing up in school hungry and maybe sleeping in a shelter and hearing gunshots all night long and then being measured by the same yardstick that young children, youngsters who are going to schools and have all the supports and the parents have all the resources they need, it's not fair. And we're saying it's the shame of the nation and we have to fix it. Is David Shapiro here? David Shapiro was here yesterday. David, you're here somewhere up there. Where's David? Yes. David is doing the public policy work through Mentor. So the mentoring organizations being represented from all over the country know David Shapiro. Make sure that you go to that phenomenal conference every year in DC in January, National Mentoring Month. Sean Dove, I know you're in the house. Where's our beloved Sean Dove? Campaign for Black Male Achievement. Sean, you're in the house. Sean, get up, let people see you, stay up. You need, to, you need to go to Rumble, Young Man Rumble. You need to get in touch with Sean and make sure that you, it's a gathering of the brothers, the most extraordinary thing you'll ever see. So I'm saying, you know what, no matter where our ancestors come from, no matter where our parents come from, no matter how, how difficult our lives may seem sometime, we have to know this. This is not the rough side of the mountain. This is not the rough side of the mountain if you know your history. If you know your parents, your grandparents, your great grand's history, we all have challenges. Barack Obama had mighty challenges in that White House as people called him out of his name and disrespected him. So don't take people's bad behavior personally and don't let them manage you into bad behavior. This is what we're here to do today. And I also want to give a shout out for Oakland Bay Area Cares there in the house. Sacramento Cares is in the house. Seattle Cares, where are you? Stand up. Sacramento, Seattle, all of our units from around the country, Oakland cares. Okay, so here we go. We're going to begin, and we have Victor Cruz coming out. Victor, you're coming out with Raul? 
No, Victor Cruz is not. I thought somebody was introducing them. No, here you are, Victor Cruz. You all know? Victor, we're gonna ask you to introduce yourself. Everybody knows him as a New York giant. We claim him. Thank you, and Eddie Cuba. Hello. Give Eddie a round of applause, please. Thank you. So introduce yourself. Tell us, you Well, know. my name is Victor Cruz, for those of you that didn't know from your lovely introduction, and former giant, former, well, not former, Super Bowl champion. Um, yeah. Can't start this off without, without saying that. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm here, or why I'm here with Eddie, of course, is he's a part of the Boys and Girls Club, and my foundation works very closely with the Boys and Girls Club, and you know, keeping kids off the streets and making sure that they're safe and they're involved in different things, especially through my foundation geared towards STEM education and making sure that they're, I'm using my resources to get these kids out and, and see different things about uh, the world and different ways to view the world and, uh, and see it outside of the view and the viewpoint from Patterson, New Jersey. I want them to get, oh, we got some Patterson, Patterson's we in got the some house. Jersey people here. Well, you know what, this is so like important to, to understand because you know Victor Cruz does not have to be doing any of this right now, right? We know he has resources. He could be like in the Caribbean chilling on his own yacht. But the village is on fire, so he's doing the work. And, and Eddie, just, just tell us some of the things that you've been exposed to, because Vic has taken you and other young people under wing. Now, I'm going to ask you to do this while I rearrange the chairs, if you all don't mind, because I won't be able to see the person who's on this side of you. Just go ahead and tell them. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Eddie Cuba. I am, was born in New York, raised in Patterson by my single mother. I don't know where she is, but... She's around here somewhere. Um, when I was smaller, my mother decided to put me in the Boys and Girls Club, which is basically a program that um, helps, ki it helps kids with their homework, it helps kids with their studies, it gives them a distraction to get distracted of what's happening at home. Um, things that I've been exposed to from the Boys and Girls Club is I've been exposed to many of my passions that I still hold today, as in dance, film, photography, more of the art stuff, but it also brought um, a lot of interest, uh, interest in the STEM field. So now I am thinking of going to major in IT wow. in college, yeah. This is exciting. And you know what it says to those of us who are running mentoring organizations? And you know the name of this panel is Beyond Ice Cream Cones and Ball Games, right? That young people need more. Ball games are nice to take young people to. Ice cream, huh, don't give them a lot, you know, but give them some. But they need more. Young people who don't have all the resources and supports that young people need to thrive need more than just the experience of going to a game and having a sweet treat. You know, they need the kinds of things that you are delivering, Victor. Talk about some of the things. Well, Eddie, maybe you tell, tell us what Victor has exposed you and other young people to. Victor, Victor has really helped me a lot. He's helped me through a lot. Um, as in the programs that he's been doing for everyone in the Boys and Girls Club, as um, bringing, bringing ice cream trucks or taking us to go get uh, supplies for school or helping us get um, new clothes and new shoes that we get to design ourselves. He's been helping us more, he's been helping us get out there. And one experience that he's um, exposed me to, I was invited to the 2014 Obama White House Science Fair, and I got exposed to many different, um, many different experiences. Well, that's, that's and just to, just to piggyback that, I think the biggest thing for any mentor or any person in my position that's able to give back is just, I didn't want to just give back and say, here's, you know, some money, go build something, I'll check back in with y'all later. It was more so like, here's the money that I'm raising for you guys through my resources, and I'm going to pull up and make sure that things are going the right way, that Eddie's, you know, making sure he's doing the right situations. And I want to be present, you know? It wasn't just... Um, it wasn't just about lending my name and then walking away and doing other things. I wanted to make sure, especially because it's, it's in my hometown, it's where I grew up, it's the Boys and Girls Club I went to. So I want to make sure I'm there, present, giving back, and using my resources to, to the best of my abilities. And how has this changed your life? The giving, giving is a real passion for you, and, and how has it enriched you? Um, it's changed my life, honestly. Just being able to, because I remember being 
you know, Eddie's age or even younger, being in the Boys and Girls Club, nobody came and talked to me. Nobody came and, like, rebuilt our pool. Like, literally four or five years ago, I walked in the pool in the Boys and Girls Club in Patterson and looked exactly the same as when I was a kid. It was moldy. It was like things were falling off the ceiling. And then with my resources, thankfully, we got to rebuild the entire swimming pool, and it's a fully Olympic-sized pool now. So, like... That I, I I still I owe you a dip in the pool too, Eddie. I do, you know I remember promising that I still owe, I still owe y'all that. But I think with that and seeing kids enjoying different parts of the Boys and Girls Club and seeing kids running up to me when I walk in the front door and say thank you for the computers or thank you for the you know the Xbox that we got or thank you for the you know this room that we got. Oh wow! All right. Yeah. Tell them we'll call them back later. <laughs> good song though. A good song. <laughs> oh wow! This is really. Now, <laughs> thank you, Frank Ocean, as we continue on. Um, but yeah, that's just, it's changed my life. Just seeing these kids smile and seeing these kids just excited about the Boys and Girls Club and not just going through the dull drums of every day and feeling like they're only there because their mom or dad's put them there so they're not home or out running with their friends, but they're actually learning and experiencing new things and telling me about it as I pull up. So that's, the, that's probably the best part. Wow, and you wanted to say? Yeah, also, every single time Victor Cruz visits, uh, visits us, everyone's excited. Like, every little kid will go up to him, hug him, because they're excited to see someone that has grown up where we've grown up and actually gotten out of where they think that they can't get out of. Because we, as kids, sometimes we think that since we grew up here, we can't leave here. This is what we're going to be, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to be the stereotype. But they've seen that a person can actually rise up from the blow. And you know what we're seeing is that you can't do it by yourself. And some people move forward, do very well, and never look back. So, you know, we bow down to you, Victor Cruz, because you are the real deal. And, and we say to you, just young, handsome man, you, you owe to, you know? We saw your mother uh, backstage, and she's here with you. And for all the support that you are given, you know that you have to give it back, and we know you will. We're coming to see you. I'm going to be at the Academy Awards when you win yours, so don't forget to invite me, okay? We're going to ask the rest of our team to come all out, please. And you know what? I'm going to ask you to move down one, Victor. I think I better sit right here. Here, move down one more. That's, there we go. And I think I'll sit here. That way I can see the two of you, and everybody else is coming out. That's right. Makpia. Makpia Black Elk. And Raul. His mentee, and Mashan Bacon, and Christian Champagne. There we go. Okay. I wanted to start with the young brothers. You know, I want to ask, let me ask you, Raul, and you, Christian. Don't, don't just speak for yourselves. What do young men today really need? You know, girls and women, we always talk about our stuff. You heard the president yesterday you know, with Mark, uh, with um, uh, Mr. Curry, really talking about how women, we, we, we share what we're feeling. We can speak to each other about our pain. We can speak about our longings. We can speak about our needs. Not all of us, but most of us. But men, boys, you all suffer in silence. There's so many things that you want to say, but you don't feel safe, as the president said, finding that safe place in order to really speak. So. Speak for the young men who are not here today. What, what do young men say in Albuquerque? Because what they need in Albuquerque is needed around the country. And you're speaking for Latinos and also Native Americans. All right, so <clears throat> the first thing that comes to mind is more of like, young men of color need more of a place to heal, grow, and thrive. Um, you know, so that way they have their I guess, their community partners, you know. My community partner, Mahbi Black Elk, he and his homie, Jake Foreman, they, they came in and they brought me in, they brought me as, into a part of Karuna Colectivo, and, and that was where they taught me how to become an entrepreneur. Um, so what were you going through that you needed that support? I, I started having to, you know, um, so I was taken away from my parents and then I was living with my older brother and I felt like I had to, you know, put in a, to a put, put into the house and I was, I felt like I had to help my brother pay rent. How old were you? I was 14 years old when I was first taken away. Um, and then now I'm just kind of working with it and, 
you know, try and go by step by step, you know, um, through the program that Mahbiya has created, the Hupo Alliance, where they, I guess they really touch on the aspects of like the mind, the heart, the body, and the surroundings. Um, I guess there's more ways to measure success um, than through the academics of school. There's, there's, that's just part of the mind, you know. But you also have to be healthy, like emotionally and spiritually, and you have to have healthy relationships in your community, so that way you can succeed and like excel in life. So you're saying that's what young men need. They need a place where they can heal, grow, and thrive. Yes. Wow. Yes. Krishna. Um. What black men need in Chicago, young black men, is the same space uh, to, to feel comfortable to talk about everything that's going on in their lives. Uh, I've seen a lot of my friends struggle through high school with watching their friends die, and they suffer from PTSD of seeing their, their last friend take their last breath, or they grow up and there's no food in the house to, to actually feed themselves nutrition because you live in a food desert. Um, what we really need in Chicago is more BAM. We need more, more counselors to actually take the time to speak and, and ask if you're okay. Uh, I believe that with one conversation, you could change your life forever. Um, that's what we really need in Chicago is to just reflect on how, how great a lot of diamond and the roughs are, but they get stunted because they don't feel the necessary need to talk about their feelings or how they're feeling today. And it's difficult even when, you know, someone like Marshawn comes along and gives you that space. It's still difficult to open up and to share what you need, right? Um, it's difficult for the first day. The mm. first day, my first day in BIM, it was, it was weird. You know, you're not, men aren't supposed to talk about their feelings or how or what's going on in their life, you just talk to be strong. You know, you, you stay strong throughout everything. But as you come more and more to the meetings, you, you open up more, you, you trust more. You, you, you start to love these people and you start to look at your, these classmates, not as just classmates, but brothers. You know, I hope that your generation is gonna be the generation to put a lid on what men are supposed to be. You know, to be dying on the inside and to be presenting strong on the outside is to really betray yourselves. You're not betraying anybody else, you're betraying yourselves and the gift of your life. You know, Marshawn Bacon, I want to ask you, becoming a man, that's BAM, the organization that he is very much a part of in, in Chicago. Why becoming a man and what is it that you're giving the young brothers there? First of all, I want to just say I love Christian and I'm so proud of him. Um, yeah. I think when people ask me why BAM is successful, I think it speaks to that masculinity piece. Mm. It's our secret sauce in terms of our, our manhood training. One of the things, so we do mentoring, we're in the schools consistently in their lives. Uh, we're clinicians, we're, we're trained therapists who can combine that work, but it's this men's work and we call it men's work rites of passage. So. The program's called Becoming a Man. We're not teaching you to become a man. We're teaching you and giving a space for you to examine these narrow, often toxic definitions of masculinity that keep us from going to head from heart, like my young man just said. So within that space, thank you. So within that space, we can examine, hey, my friend just got shot or something happened. The traditional thing to do is go pick up a gun or do this or do that. Let's look at more solutions. And part of that means getting in touch with the emotions. And so I think one of the things that is really powerful for us is that our counselors, myself included, we are mandated to go through this same training. We go through vigorous training, we go through a, a rites of passage weekend where we have to do what we call ruthless self-examination. So going from head to heart, looking at our gut, what's, what's going on with us, our trauma, our pain, so that we can role model it for the young men. If I can't um, look at myself, so BAM has six core values, integrity, positive anger expression, accountability, self-determination, respect for womanhood, and visionary goal setting. If I can't look at myself and my life and see where am I of an integrity, where am I out of accountability, I can't role model and set up to challenge him for the same way. 
So it's very parallel in terms of everything that our counselors do in terms of looking at their own masculinity, look at it where we've been oppressors, where we've fallen into those same traps, so that when we run in BAM circles, we can have honest, safe dialogues so they can do the same thing. And you're expanding. And we're expanding. We're in Boston now, we're, we're expanding to other cities, and one of the things that we see is that there is an outcry. We see a lot of violence, we see a lot of um, you know, repression, and we see all of these connections. And so I think one of the things that BAM is able to speak to is being able to create that safe space so we can examine how these toxic and, and, and very negative roles that are put on us impact us and, and, and how we also perpetuate it. You know, this is such an extraordinary time in history because this is the first time that men, I think, are really reflecting so deeply and saying, I need another way to be because, you know, the standards that have been created are really oppressive and don't allow you to just give birth to the truth of who you are. And what we're talking about today, what the president has asked asked us to do is to come out of our silos. You know, organizations, we know how difficult it is for organizations that are black and brown led to raise money. This is true. And what we have to do is really share, come out of our silos and begin to work with one another. I mean, your program, BAM, should be all around the nation. And anybody who wants to know more about it should try to reach out to, to Marshawn after this panel. Sean Dove is up there. You need to go to Rumble Man, uh, Young Man Rumble in Louisville, Kentucky. Yes, you need to go. <laughs> the brothers are in the house, as you hear, you know. And Stephen Powell, we have a training that is, it really helps us to heal trauma. Living in poverty, not having the things that so many of us take for granted, is traumatizing. And I want to say beyond our middle class view, there are so many young people who are suffering needlessly, needlessly on our watch. And we need to be the generations to really change that, that what? That pain that is dream crushing. You know, I, I wanted to save you Makpia Black Elk. Makpia Black Elk for last. I had such a rich and deep conversation with you yesterday, with you and Tony. I always say that, you know, Jesse Jackson and I are the only two people I hear consistently speaking about indigenous people, indigenous people. My husband, Kefra Burns, is in here somewhere. Where's Kefra? Where are you, sweetie? Stand up, baby. That's my darling. That's my love. And Kefra wrote a beautiful piece for us that's narrated by Danny Glover that really talks about, because there's a lot of blame of daddies who leave. And a lot of us are mad at the men who left, who left us and maybe didn't look back. To me, the most important word is understanding. And if your father is not present in your life and you're lucky enough to have him still be alive, you know, when you are my age, which is 73, you're going to want to know, you're gonna to wanna to know, you are going to want to know your parents' story. Do you hear what I'm saying? You know, when you're 15, 17, 25, mad at him because he was a slack and he left and didn't look back and mama had to struggle. But when you're 60 and 70, you're gonna wanna know his story. We're gonna need to see some proof of the 73 because you don't look anywhere near <laughs> do not look 73. 73. Do not she at is all. killing 73. <laughs> you have to come to my wellness training. <laughs> there we go. But, but the, this is, this is you want, you're gonna want to know. You may not know now. And you know what anger does? It destroys the host. It destroys the person who is angry, does nothing to the person you're angry at. And I just, want to, I just want to say something about the men who leave. There is no person in his or her right mind who leaves his or her child. No one. They leave because of certain circumstances. And that piece that I just alluded to that Keffa wrote and Danny Glover narrated really talked about the history of oppression. You know, we're not the threat as women, but especially black men, there are a lot of people who don't want to see you succeed. And there, there are a whole host of things, that, and it has to do with fear. Fear of who you are, fear of your dominance. They let you, you're not supposed to play football. Then they let you play football and you become like the masters of it. You can't play basketball, tennis, name it. And you step in there and you become the dominant force. Keep your humility and keep going and link arms and aims and stay together. And if your daddy is alive and you're mad at him, calm yourself. Do some breathing. Call up your father and ask him his story. There are barriers, barriers that really shut down 
if a man can't bring a bicycle, because of those models we're talking about, Rashawn, if a man can't bring a bicycle, then he doesn't want to come. I better not go, because I don't have any money. I can't take him to the game. But I was saying that the, 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 the indigenous people, the people, as was stated yesterday so brilliantly, whose land we stand on right now, but because they were a people with values that others, the invaders, did not have, many native tribes had no sense of ownership of land. The land was a gift from God and it was to be shared. And I want to ask you, Makpia, to really explain to us who the different names of the indigenous people. Thank you for, thank you, uh, for that question. Uh, first up, just want to say aha mitakirpi chante washte na pelo makpia black el kamachiapi. Um, and again, thank you for acknowledging the indigenous people whose territory we're on. And thank you to the indigenous people who welcomed us yesterday. Um, that's an interesting question. That's an interesting question, uh, one that I often get asked and have been explaining my whole life. And it really is a failure of our education system to, to teach about the first people who are here. And, um, and, and you know, just, just so we know, you know, there are over 560 federally recognized tribes within the boundaries of the United States, right? That there are nearly 100 uh, tribes that aren't recognized by the federal government but are still recognized by states and groups of people who don't have either of those political statuses. Um, and, and so, you know, I think it's important to realize that of those, of those hundreds of tribes, of all those different peoples, we all have unique stories, we all have our own uh, view of the world and our own perspectives. And so, um, you know, that's, that's important for us to know and to remember. And so... Um, name them. Name you know, them. yesterday you All did, not the tribes, <laughs> but there, there are Native Americans and there are Mexican. So, so I, I think part of the conversation that we were having yesterday was that, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, because, because of that lack of education, because of that lack of story, uh, or often the only story that we do hear of Native people is of, of one of trauma, right? Or one of, of these terrible things that happen or that we're not even here. And so that can mess with our identity of being proud of who we are and have, being able to claim that. And so part of the story that I was saying is, you know, growing up, especially in New Mexico, um, you know, within, within my own family, there's, there's different ways of identifying as the same group of people. You know, my, my grandma would say that we're, we're Mexican, but some of, my, some of my relatives may say, no, that we're, we're Hispanic. You know, and it's really this, this idea to get away from this idea of, uh, or this uh, identity of, of being indigenous. You know, and so, but myself, I, I identify as Chicano Mestizo, which really, um, and Lakota as well. But it, that Chicano, that, uh, that, that Chicano name really is, is tying back to this idea of, of Mexico, right? Of, of being a land-based people here before this border was, was drawn in the sand. You know, that our people have traveled across this Turtle Island for thousands of years. And one day, one day they just said no, they drew a line in the sand. And then, and so, and after that, uh, there's, there's this limitation of, of being able to identify, to be proud of who you are, to identify as that. And so oftentimes we, we forget to say those things. And, and so many of us who are Native American, who grow up indigenous, Native, um, we don't have that opportunity or that pride or, or uh, the space to be safe to say those things. You know, we have to really give a shout out for the campaign. I mean, really that, this is one of the few spaces where Native people, where the indigenous people have had a strong voice. And, you know, this is it's such a beautiful thing. And what we never learn, anybody ever learn in school that every treaty that the United States formed, signed with Native people, with the indigenous people, every single one was broken. Has anybody ever learned that in school? No. Because, you know, folks are not going to tell you the truth. They're not going to teach you the truth, and we have to have understanding. It is very difficult for the system to really talk about what was done to people of African ancestry and Native people. It's difficult because what would happen is the indigenous people and African-American people become the heroes. 
and the people who were the oppressors and took the land become the villains. And it's difficult to teach that to your children. So we have to understand that and not demand that, but we have to know. That's why we have to create our own learning circles, you know? So I want to ask you, Makpia, about your curriculum and what it is you're pouring into the young people. Well, I think Raul did a really good job of explaining it, right? There's, there's three tenets to our school, first of all, is that we want all of our students to be academically prepared, secure in their identity, and to be holistically healthy. And so that holistically healthy piece really is what shapes the, the, our program itself. Right, that we have to take care of not just our mind because we're a school, but also our heart, our bodies, and our surroundings. And so the, the, the program really brings a safe space, like we were saying, the, a circle so that young men can come and talk about their feelings, that they can say, you know what, it's, it, this isn't weird for us to talk about these things. We all have emotions. We all have to talk about them. Uh, it's important that we take care of our community because we have to remember that we're assets to our community, right? Anything in our community that we see that needs to be changed, we can get up and do it, and we will. Wow. You know, I'm going to come back to you, Victor, and I'm going to ask that we go down the line. And I want you to just speak to us about what you want all the brothers who are here today to take away with them, whether they are adults who are delivering services or the young men to whom services are being delivered and support is being offered? Um, I think just for everyone, just m the biggest thing I want you to take away, f well, two things. One, I want you to take away everyone's relationships here with their mentors and things of that nature. Understand where this comes from. We, this is out of love. You know, we don't have to do this. This isn't something that's a part of our jobs or criteria. We do this out of love. and. And that love is reciprocated by the young people that you see here that embrace it and that take it with them and take these resources and the things they learn and take with them throughout their journeys in life. And then secondly, to the mentors out there, just use your platform. No platform is, is too small for you to influence another person, influence another, another uh, a person of color, another black man, another indigenous Mexican uh, man. Just use your platform for whatever positivity you want to you know, invoke out there into the world because no platform is too small. Don't think, oh, I'm just a teacher. I can't have an impact on you know, some kids. Or I'm just you know, a social worker. I can't do anything you know, to help these kids on a grand scale. You can do anything within your community, within your, you know, whatever resources you have to empower youth and to empower the people around you. Thank you. It's a wrap. Well, it's a wrap, so I'm gonna say one sentence, okay? Just one sentence from each of you, what you want people to take away. Please go ahead. Keep going and don't give up. All right, there you go. I wanna build on that. Keep going and don't give up and don't be scared to ask for help. Mm. I love all of you all. Love each other. Uh, health is more than physical, it's mental as well, and spiritual. You are more powerful than you realize and embrace your emotions. Wow. Well, you know what? I'm going to have the last word before I say amen. I want you to remember that you're more than you seem. You are more than you see when you look in the mirror, that you are human and divine. And your divinity is what will see you through. Remember that. It's beyond your view, but it's there. And you don't have to do anything. It's the breath that's breathing you without your asking for it. You know, it's the hand that can grasp. It's the heart that can feel. So you don't want to shut down those emotions. You want to feel them. And if you're ever with a partner who says, I don't want to see you cry because you're a man, you have the wrong partner. Amen. You have the wrong partner. So we say God bless you. Reach out to Stephen Powell if you need to deepen your mentoring gifts to the community. Stephen, he's going to be in the back. He has brochures for you. Sean Dove is going to be in the back. You need to go rumble. You need to go rumble. David Shapiro, I know you're here. Go to that conference. David should be in the back also. The conference, which is in January. It's another gathering like this. People in the mentoring space coming out of silos, working together. God bless you. Keep you. Stay strong.